All right, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Tonight, we're going to read another sutta. It's what we do every Sunday night. Uh, tonight, we are still exploring the Majima Nikaya, the middle length discourses. We're moving on to sutta number 64 this evening. This is the Maha Malunkya Sutta. Last week, we did the Chula Malunkya Sutta, the shorter discourse to the monk named Malunkya. And today, it's the Maha Malunkya Sutta, the, the long discourse to Malunkya. Um, so this sutta is sort of a, uh, I wouldn't say it's like a famous sutta exactly, but it is sort of a notable sutta for being uh, a very clear teaching on what are called the five lower fetters. So we're going to talk about the five lower fetters this evening. That's the topic for tonight. Um, yeah, let me, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll just read the beginning of the sutta, which will introduce the topic. But then before we sort of really move through it, we're going to have to know like, what are these five lower <laughs> fetters and what does all that mean so um it it starts off real quick like a lot of these early suttas do there's not a lot of beating around the bush in that way uh so again this is the mahamalunkya sutta thus have i heard on one occasion the blessed one was living at savatti in jetta's grove anatta pindika's park there he addressed the bhikkhus thus Bhikkhus, venerable sir, they replied. And the blessed one said this. Bhikkhus, do you remember the five lower fetters as taught by me? When this was said, the venerable Malunkya Putta, the child of Malunkya, replied, venerable sir, I remember the five lower fetters as taught by the Blessed One. But Malunkya, the Buddha says, in what way do you remember the five lower fetters as taught by me? Venerable Sir, I remember identity view as a lower fetter taught by the Blessed One. I remember doubt as a lower fetter taught by the Blessed One. I remember adherence to rules and observances as a lower fetter taught by the Blessed One. I remember sensual desire as a lower fetter taught by the Blessed One. I remember ill will as a lower fetter taught by the Blessed One. In this way, venerable sir, it is in this way, Venerable Sir, that I remember the five lower fetters as taught by the Blessed One. Now, before we go further, there's a few of those we need to clarify. So even before we do that, let's talk about a fetter. <laughs> so these are called, this, this sutta is about the five lower samyojana. So a sam yojana, the, the root of that word is yog, like yoga, a kind of yoking in that way, like an animal with the with the yoke. And this is sam yojana. And so this is truly like the idea of sort of like um being, yeah, being fettered, being uh held up, being um chained down. All of these ideas. Now, this, we need to remember, this is a, a classic example that we need to remember, you know, that the Buddha uses a lot of different analogies or similes. And what I mean is, is that, you know, we've heard talk of poisons, the three poisons. We've heard talk of hindrances, nivaranya. We've heard talk of uh, bandha, bondage. 
So there's a lot of different analogies or similes that the Buddha uses to talk about things that are holding us back. Just to put it super simply, like we're, we want to be, you know, less suffering, not suffering. We want to be more joyful. We want to, whatever it is, there's these things that are holding us back. They're fetters, they're obstacles or obstructions in that way. Now, in the world of Buddhism, or at least I guess in the world of early Buddhism, and it would depend upon the specific school, of course, and all of that, but in general, there are 10 samyojana, there are 10 fetters that are keeping us from the awakened enlightened state, the state of not suffering, call it nirvana. Traditionally in Buddhism, there are 10 fetters. We, of course, are only going to talk about sort of the what are called the five lower fetters. Now, the reason why these are called the five lower fetters is because all of these, all 10 of these fetters, these samyojana, well, in within the cosmology of Buddhism, these are the things that are keeping us bound to the cyclical process of birth, death, and rebirth, to samsara, to samsara, right? And so the idea is, is that if you could cut all 10 fetters, you would stop the cyclical process of rebirth. In other words, you would stop the cycle of suffering. That's if you cut off all 10 if you only cut off the five lower fetters, as we're going to see in the sutta, if you cut off these five, it means you're not coming back for a human rebirth. And this is what they call in the early Buddhist tradition, a non-returner. They're not an arhat, they're not a fully enlightened being yet, but they've cut off enough of the gunk They've cut off enough of the bad karma that they're not going to be reborn sort of in the human or even uh, uh, reproductive realm of, of Kama. Basically reborn in a kind of meditative heavenly state where they'll basically work on those five upper fetters. So this sutta, again, is only going to be dealing with the five lower fetters. And that's what Malunkia just reported back to the Buddha. And indeed, those are the five lower fetters. So let's talk about those real quick. It's going to take a moment. The first of these is actually going to be the trickiest. So the first of these is what our translators of this version, they translated as this identity view. And so what is being translated as the identity view is the sakkaya drishti or, or the satkaya drishti in, in Sanskrit. The, the sat, the, the view, the drishti, the opinion or the, you know, the cosmological view of the satkaya, the true body is literally what that term means, the true body. Now, the thing about it is, is that I know that you know, because I know that you've all been studying Dharma a long time, I know that you know about this kind of essential teaching of Buddhism of no self. Well, that's kind of, you know, that is what we're going to be talking about tonight. But tonight's a fun night, because what we're going to learn is that Buddhism actually has a few different words for what we in English would kind of always just translate as self or the like here, the a personality in that way. But interestingly, Buddhism has all of these different words that have different connotations. They, they are pointing to different things. You are probably most familiar with the idea of the, of the Atman or the Atta the idea of like what is translated as like a soul in that way. And normally we are talking about the Buddhist teaching of anatta, 
<clears throat> or in Sanskrit, it's called anatman. No atman. There is no atman. But what is the atman? The atman is that which reincarnates. So it doesn't have anything to do with this particular body. It is the, and this is why the atman gets translated as soul with the idea that it's what's being reincarnated. That's like the true self that's being reincarnated. But that's actually not what's being spoken about here as, a, as the fetter, as a lower fetter. What's being called here, the true body, this is a very interesting idea. There's a number of different like approaches to this idea of the true body, the view of the true body. I'm going to kind of try to give it to you as simply as I can. So what we're specifically kind of thinking about with this first fetter, it is the idea of a self. It, it Again, like the idea of a personality view, you know, it, that's a, that's kind of a clunky, clunky way to express this idea, but it's basically what they're talking about. What they're pointing to with this term, the true body. Well, I use this, I, I use this example a lot, but I'll use it, uh, uh, I'll use it one more time. So I recently, uh, and by recently, I mean many months ago, I recently banged my finger to where I got a blood spot in my fingernail and I watched the fingernail grow. And what of course that allowed me to realize is that this fingernail on, on my finger, it's only like four months old. The fingernail, it's only four months old, right? Now, if, the, if this fingernail is only four months old, but I claim to be 50 years old, or at least my friends and family and society calls me 50 years old. What exactly is 50 years old? Not this fingernail. <laughs> this fingernail is only a few months old. This, this beard, I've been growing this beard now for a few months, but it's not 50 years old. All of this hair that I've been growing for years, this is not 50 years old. So when I, when I say that I'm 50 years old, what am I referring to? Well, you'll notice that when I, when I said that it can't be the fingernail because the fingernail is only a few months old, what I'm saying is, is oh yeah, yeah not the fingernail <laughs> okay then what what's 50 years old and what we think is 50 years old is the true body not this fingernail is not my true body because again it's only a few months old the beard the hair all the other stuff it's it's only a few months old and i don't claim to be four months old I claim supposedly to be 50 years old. So if the body that is 50 years old is, does not include the fingernail, then the idea of what is 50 years old, the true, Michael's true body, and that's a view, <laughs> that is a opinion or a belief in that way, that there is the real you. Now, what I want us to notice, and, and I actually, I'm going to introduce another of the, the higher fetters. Uh, I'm going to talk about it in a moment. But another of the fetters has to do with what we would call ego, what we would call like a self in that way. I know this is getting complicated. But so in other words, there's a few different possibilities for the true self. It could be the Atman that reincarnates. It could be the true body 
which again is the one that I think is the real me that's 50 years old, even though I couldn't point to what is exactly 50 years old, but I believe, I believe that there's me that's 50 years old. That's the true body. And what the Buddha is saying is, is that that view that there's a real you, <laughs> that's a view that's a fetter that's holding you back and ultimately keeping you bound in cyclical existence. So that's the idea of the satkaya. And, it, and again, it's always the satkaya drishti, the view of there being a real you body in that way. Now, what we really want to notice, actually, I'm going to go deeper. Any questions about the? We're still going to talk about the satkaya. All right, so here's the really like deep, meaning of the true body. The true body is understood as that which exists unto itself, meaning with that which is not dependent upon anything else, that which is not relative to anything else, that which is sort of true unto itself in that way. And that's what, again, I don't think I'm the fingernail. I don't think I'm the beard. I think I'm me. <laughs> and that's sort of what we're talking about is that idea of this true me in that sense. All right. Any questions about that? All right. The second fetter that Malunkya uh, kind of reports back to the Buddha is vichichika, doubt. Now, I talk about doubt every now and then, and I'll just mention one thing because of the sutta tonight. Now, I often talk about doubt in contrast to certainty. And what I mean by that is, is that the state of being in doubt is one of not being certain of a sort of like, eh, maybe I should do that. Or maybe I should do that. I don't, I'm not, I don't quite know which I should do versus a clear certainty that that's the way. That's normally how I describe the difference between doubt and certainty in Buddhism. But tonight, I need to kind of introduce you to the more formal definition of doubt. In this context tonight, doubt is going to be about doubting the Buddha, doubting the Dharma. It specifically, or, or a great example of this, it would be about, say, this teaching regarding the cessation of suffering. You know, Buddhism is a tradition that in a way is promising you, or at least saying that, you know, what we're offering, we're offering the, the complete cessation of suffering. No more stress, no more anxiety, no more worry, no more fear, no more any of that. Totally gone. You might doubt that such a state is even possible. You might think, no, that you're always going to have a little bit of fear. You're always going to have a little bit of doubt. It's not possible to completely cease suffering. Do you notice how if you have that view, it might be very hard to ever arrive at the cessation of suffering? Notice how it could, how the very doubt itself might be a fetter in that way. We're going to have, a. by the way, I'm just introducing what the five fetters are. We have a whole sutta to read about them. So, but those are what we're talking about in terms of doubt. Doubt that liberation is possible. Doubt that the Eightfold Path is the way. Doubt. The third fetter is one I don't think I've ever talked about in Dharma Doors. It's one of those topics that, you know, it, it gets mentioned, but it just hasn't come up. So this is what is being translated in our sutta as 
adherence to rules and observances. Now, this one's tricky, and it's tricky because of translation. I've been actually trying to really nail down the exact translation of this. So it does have to do with what you would know of as shilla, shilla as like discipline, as a, a kind of like, you know, precepts, rules, and things like that. Now, when I was in graduate school, the way that this was explained to me was that it was about a kind of, um, uh, it was a response to what you, what we could loosely just call Brahmanism, a kind of general, you know, theistic religious tradition of India. And it's very based in rituals, rites, rituals, and various observances. And there's basically an idea, you know, that if you do these rituals or you do these rites, then like things could happen in the world. Um, I'm thinking of things like rituals to make it rain, rituals to get uh, uh, animals to reproduce and, you know, various kind of concerns that people would do rituals for. The way that I was taught about this one is that the belief in the efficaciousness of that type of those rites and rituals is a fetter. And the way that my professor explained it to me was that it was sort of like what we would think of as either superstition or even obsessive compulsive disorder, frankly, of like believing that I have to, you know, turn the doorknob three times in order to for it to be locked. That's a kind of adherence to rituals and the buddha is saying that that's a fetter actually now this is going to get confusing of course because buddhism is a tradition of shila it's a, tra a tradition of discipline and a, a kind of ritual almost but there is a difference between a kind of belief that if i do this I will be rewarded by some other forces. I will be rewarded by God versus a more Buddhist deterministic cause and effect understanding, which is that, oh no, if I'm not violent and I don't lie and I don't steal, these are the karmic consequences of not doing those things. And it's not a mystery. <laughs> And actually, the Buddha will explain to you why it's not a mystery in that sense. So for me, my understanding of that particular fetter, uh, it's called uh, Shilabhata Paramasa, this adherence, strict adherence to rules and observances in that way. But again, the Buddha is going to explain a little more. The fourth fetter is of course one that you will find in almost every list of all the all the things that are holding us back. And so this one is about kama chanda. Chanda, desire for kama, for sensual pleasure. Now, of course, normally kama is sexual pleasure, but I think it's important to make it about all five of the senses, and it's sort of like whatever kind of you're into in that way, whatever delights you sensorily. Again, we will talk more about it, but this should be of no surprise to anybody who has studied Dharma that Kama Chandra is a obstacle in that way. And then the fifth of the lower fetters is Vyapada, ill will, anger, bitterness, resentment, that, that, <laughs> that's the fifth fetter. And now again, the idea is, is that if you overcome the delusion of a true body, you overcome doubt, you overcome adherence to rules and rituals, you overcome your needy desire, and you overcome ill will, then that cuts off the five lower fetters and you would have no reason to be reborn in that sense back in the human realm okay those are the five fetters 
really quickly, because I won't probably have another opportunity tonight to mention it, really quickly, if you wanted to get all the way liberated, really quickly, let me tell you about the five other fetters. They're subtle. The first one is called uh, Rupa Raga, a kind of a Raga, an attraction, a wantiness for Rupa, for form. But what they're what they mean is is a kind of uh, a a a wanting cravingness for meditative states in the realm of form. So it's actually about like getting off on being in deep meditative states and that being a delight to you. And now you're kind of attached to it. So Rupa Raga, a Rupa Raga, so a kind of attraction to the formless realm. So attraction to Samadhi states, even deeper states of meditation. And then the third of the upper fetters is Manas. That's the idea of I am. Manas is what you will often see translated as the conceit, I am. And the way that I often describe that one or the way that I like to interpret that one, it's about the delusion that I'm thinking rather than there being thinking happening. A very subtle difference, but the experience of thought is thoughts happening. The idea that I'm doing it, yeah, look a little closer next time you're thinking, and you'll notice that you are not doing it. <laughs> you are experiencing it in that sense. But that idea that I'm talking I'm thinking the I, the owning the owning of it that is the conceit that I am in that way that's manas that's that uh, third one the fourth of the upper fetters is interesting because it's the it is if you've heard of the the hindrance or the obstruction the nivaranya of restlessness and worry right? Well, just the restlessness part, just being restless, uh, udhacha, udhacha, this restlessness is a fetter, but it's a subtle fetter that, you know, even, you know, kind of heavenly divine beings still have restlessness in that way. And then the fifth of the subtle upper fetters is avidya, Ignorance, not knowing in that way. Another classic Buddhist problem. Okay, that's all 10 fetters. Any questions about any of that? Oh, good. We can get to the we can get to the good stuff. So this this sutta, like all suttas, or like a lot of the suttas we've been talking about, is um it has kind of movements or sections. So let me let's dive into the first section. By the way, there's a little backstory here about Malunkya, because once Malunkya, Malunkya Putta, once Malunkya Putta says, Ooh, ooh, Buddha, I remember the five fetters. They are, and then he explains the five fetters. After that, the Buddha says, Malunkya Putta. To whom do you remember me having taught the five fetters in that way? And he seems to be criticizing Malunkya Putta. And there's a whole backstory to why the Buddha is criticizing Malunkya Putta. And it's kind of actually important to the, the whole sutta. What it is, is let's take for simplicity's sake, let's translate kama chanda the sensual desire for me that one is very easily exchanged with addiction a kind of you know a really really unhealthy needing of sensory stimuli in various ways 
So let's just do that for now, for simplicity's sake. Let's translate or transpose in that sense, Kamachanda, one of the fetters, as addiction. And now let's look at the nature of addiction and ask ourselves this question, or actually, let me put it to you simply. Malunkya Putta expressed the view that the fetters are only a problem when they're present. In other words, if I, let's say I have um, an, an addiction, let's say I'm uh, addicted to alcohol, let's just say, the idea is, is that if I were in a state of like needing a drink really bad and feeling really anxious and all of that, so I was like really going through the addiction, then the idea would be that, ooh, it has arisen, it is there. But if I'm just kind of hanging out, you know, having a good time with friends and I'm not actually craving or needing alcohol at that moment, like I'm just kind of chilling. Malunkya Putta expressed the opinion that, oh, that person doesn't have the fetters because they're, he's, they're not suffering from the effects of addiction. And the Buddha corrected Malunkya Putta and said, no, 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 they have it. It just is, it's latent. And this sutta is, a, is actually, a, it's a teaching about latent tendencies. So it's important that we know that Malunkya Putta had this view that the fetters are only a problem when they're a problem in that sense. So the Buddha says, hey, when did you ever hear me explain the five fetters that way? If you did, there's a problem. And he says, wouldn't wanderers of other sex confute you, meaning challenge your opinion there, with the simile of a baby? with the simile of an infant. Because a young tender infant lying prone doesn't even have the notion of identity. So how could the identity view arise in a baby? Yet the underlying tendency to the identity view lies within the baby, the Buddha says. Those wanderer, those other sex, those people of the other sex, they might say a young tender infant lying prone doesn't have the idea of the Dharma, doesn't have the idea of the teachings. So how could they doubt the teachings or how could doubt about the teachings arise in a baby? The Buddha says, yet the underlying tendency to doubt lies within the baby. A young, tender infant lying prone doesn't even have the notion of rules and observances. So how could adherence to rules and observances arise in a baby? Yet the underlying tendency to adhere to rules and observances lies within a baby. A young, tender infant lying prone doesn't even have the notion of sensual pleasures. So how could sensual desire arise in a baby? Yet the underlying tendency to sensual desire lies within a baby. A young, tender infant lying prone doesn't even have the notion of beings. So how could ill will towards beings arise in him or arise in the baby? Yet the underlying tendency towards ill will lies within a baby. So Malunkya Putta, would not the wanderers of other sex confute you with this simile of an infant? So this is, I get, as a Dharma teacher, I get this question all the time, which is, aren't babies then sort of enlightened Zen masters because they are without attachment to self? And at a certain age, they don't even really have a distinguished sense of self and other. So aren't they enlightened little beings? <laughs> Not according to Buddhism. And it has all to do with the anusaya or anushya. So the word that's being translated in this section that I just read, the word that's being translated as 
underlying tendencies that a baby has the underlying tendencies the word is anusya or anusya in sanskrit and indeed it means latent underlying tendencies that are like dormant but they are there ready to activate in that sense so the the way that Malunkya Putta presented the fetters allowed for these critics to say, but then a baby is enlightened. And then the Buddha corrects Malunkya Putta's view that the fetters are only present when they have arisen. The Buddha corrects that view and says, no, 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 because a baby isn't enlightened because of underlying tendencies. Is that all? Does that kind of make sense to everybody? As we move forward in the in the sutta, actually, it'll I would uh, I want to stress this more. But what it is is, it's really about this idea that, like, a baby in that sense, an infant, is really, really just getting ready to develop a sense of self. Like again, the latent tendencies are there. The latent tendencies to get angry are there. The latent tendencies for all of these things are there. And so just like all human beings in that way, they're going to come up. So what the Buddha is saying is, is that it is very, very, very different. The difference between a baby to where these things haven't arisen versus a person where they have arisen and they have eradicated them and they're not coming back ever. That is very different than a baby. And that's an enlightened being in that way. Okay, shall we keep going? All right. So after explaining to Malunkya Putta what was wrong with his sort of presentation, uh, thereupon, the Venerable Ananda said, It's time, Blessed One. It's time. Sublime One, it's time for the Blessed One to teach the five lower fetters. Having heard it from the Blessed One, the bhikshus will remember it. Then listen closely, Ananda, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Venerable Sir, the Venerable Ananda replied, and the Blessed One said this. By the way, really quickly, we've had a talk recently about, in Buddhism, the idea of timing. And the Buddha Buddhas are known for having perfect timing, meaning that they know exactly when the right time is to deliver a teaching. And I just want you to know that this little section where Ananda's like, oh, it's time, it, Buddha, it's time. He's announcing that it's the right time. Like this is the fortuitous moment. All right. And so the Blessed One said this. Here, Ananda, an untaught ordinary person who has no regard for noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dharma who has no regard for a true person and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dharma. Well, that person abides with a mind obsessed and enslaved by the view of an identity of a satkaya. And they don't understand as it actually is the escape from the arisen view of an identity. And then, when that view of identity has become habitual and is uneradicated, then it's a lower fetter. One abides with a mind obsessed and enslaved by doubt. And one doesn't understand as it actually is the escape from arisen doubt. And then when that doubt has become habitual and is uneradicated, it's a lower fetter. One abides with a mind obsessed 
and enslaved by adherence to rules and observances. And one doesn't understand, as it actually is, the escape from adherence to rules and observances. And then when that adherence to rules and observances has become habitual and is uneradicated, it's a lower fetter. One abides with a mind obsessed and enslaved with sensual desire. And one doesn't understand, as it actually is, escape from sensual desire. And when sensual desire has become habitual and is uneradicated, it's a lower fetter. One abides with a mind obsessed and enslaved by ill will. And one doesn't understand, as it actually is, escape from ill will. And when that ill will has become habitual and is uneradicated, it is a lower fetter. Now, a well-taught noble disciple who has regard for noble ones and is skilled in, and disciplined in their dharma, who has regard for true people and is skilled and disciplined in their dharma, such a person does not abide with a mind obsessed and enslaved by the view of identity. They understand. They understand as it actually is the escape from arisen views of identity. And the view of identity, together with the underlying tendency to it, are abandoned. This person, they do not abide with a mind obsessed and enslaved by doubt. They do not abide with a mind obsessed and enslaved by adherence to rules and observances. They do not abide with a mind obsessed and enslaved by sensual desire. And they do not abide with a mind obsessed and enslaved by ill will. They understand, as it actually is, escape from those fetters. They understand as it actually is the escape from arisen ill will and ill will together with the underlying tendency to it is abandoned. So in that way, all five lower fetters are abandoned. Two very important points to make in those sections. So we have the unskilled, ordinary person, and we have our skilled, trained person. Notice that the big difference between the two, of course, is non-recognition of these things as fetters. And then the key to this whole sutra is that idea that when one doesn't understand as they actually are, escape from these things, then those five things become habitual. That's the key to Buddhism right there, that these things become habitual. Just like everything else, we become just habituated to it in that sense. And so we have the one section, which is about the common person, where it has become habituated, and therefore it's not eradicated, and that's a fetter. Whereas a well-taught noble disciple understands escape from those five fetters. And then together with the underlying tendency, the anusaya or anusya is eradicated. So it's not just that the present arisen Anger, let's say, let's take one of the fetters, anger. It's not just that the arisen anger has gone away. No, the very underlying tendency towards anger is eradicated. So the very, by the way, in Mahayana Buddhism, later Buddhism, the whole discourse about these underlying tendencies becomes the discourse about bijas or seeds the idea that there's these like seeds waiting to sprout. 
So even though I'm not angry right now, I have the seeds of anger ready to be watered by some jerk. <laughs> I kid, of course. But you see my point that the seeds are there waiting to be watered and then they will sprout. But if you have er eradicated the seeds, if you've eradicated the anusia, there's nothing there to pop up anymore. So that's the idea. Any questions about those two sections? Great. Now, of course, like all of Buddhism, I'm, I often say this. If the Buddha just told us what was wrong and then said bye, that would suck. <laughs> so luckily, the Buddha tells us the way, the path to doing all of this. So section seven. Page 539, if you happen to have the book, the Buddha says, don't worry, Ananda. There is a path, Ananda. There is a way to the abandoning of the five lower fetters. That, now, the idea that anyone without relying on this path, on that way, shall know or see or abandon the five lower fetters, there's no way, Ananda, it would be impossible. Just like when there's a great tree standing possessed of heartwood, it's not possible that anyone shall cut out its heartwood without first cutting through its bark in its sapwood. So too, Ananda, there is a path. There is a way to abandoning the five lower fetters, and it is possible. And if somebody doesn't follow this path, that would be impossible. There is a path, Ananda, a way to abandoning the five lower fetters. Now that someone relying on that path, on that way, that they shall know and see and abandon the five lower fetters, that is possible following this path. Just like when there's a great tree standing possessed of heartwood, it is possible that someone shall cut out its heartwood by first cutting through its bark and its sapwood. So too, there is a path and it is only by this path that liberation is possible. Questions? Next little section, which is a continuation of the path, an analogy. Suppose, Ananda, the river Ganges were full of water, right up to the brim, so that crows could drink from it. And then a feeble, weak man came to the Ganges thinking, by swimming across the stream with my arms, I shall get safely across to the further shore of this river, of this river Ganges. Yet he would not be able to get safely across. So too, when the Dharma is being taught to someone for the cessation of the view of a personality, if their mind does not enter into it and acquire confidence, steadiness, and resolution, then they can be regarded as being like that feeble man. Now suppose, Ananda, the river Ganges were full of water right up to the brim so that crows could drink from it. And then a strong man came thinking, by swimming across this stream with my arms, I shall get safely across to the further shore of this Ganges river. And they would be able to get safely across. So too, when the Dharma is being taught to someone for the cessation of the view of personality, if their mind enters into it and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution, then they can be regarded as being like that strong man. By the way, if you didn't catch it, there is always going on in Buddhism a grand kind of metaphor of getting to the other shore of getting to the other side. And I just want to remind you, you know, that's about escaping samsara, 
escaping the cyclical process of birth, death, and rebirth, and sort of getting to the other shore, which is nirvana in that way. So samsara, cross the river of transmigration and get to the other shore, which is nirvana. So that language of getting to the other shore, I can't stress like how how much of how much of buddhism is built on top of this metaphor all the way to the point of the great vehicle the idea of the mahayana is that it's the big cruise liner that gets all of humanity all of sentient beings to the other shore there's the parable of the raft there are so many of these buddhist analogies of crossing a river to the other shore this is just one more of those analogies. And it has to do, of course, with actually what's interesting is the way that this sutta, it's kind of about the five lower fetters, but then they kind of just reduce it down to the view of a personality. And that like, that's like the main one in that way. And, you know, if you really kind of get into your dharma, you do kind of recognize why that particular view of a personality in that way, all the other fetters are hinging on that one. Right. So. All right. So there's a really, really important part coming up. So I want to make sure to get there. So let's get to the path. So. <laughs> and what Ananda is the path? Because I know you want to know. And what, Ananda, is the path, the way to the abandoning of the five lower fetters? Well, here, with seclusion from acquisitions, with the abandoning of unwholesome states, with the complete tranquilization of bodily samskara, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. Whatever exists therein of material form, rupa, vedana, sensations, samya, perception, Samskara, formations, and vijnana, consciousness. So the five aggregates. Once again, whatever exists therein of the five aggregates, the practitioner, the bhikkhu, sees those states as impermanent, as suffering, as a disease, as a tumor, as a barb as a calamity, as an affliction, as alien, as disintegrating, as shunyata, as void, and as not self. The practitioner turns the mind away from those states and directs it towards the deathless element, doing so thus, thinking that deathless element. This is the peaceful. This is the sublime. That is the stilling of all samskara, of all conditioning, of all habits. So the stilling of all conditioning, the relinquishing of all attachments, the destruction of all craving, dispassion, cessation, nirvana. If one is steady in that, one attains the destruction of the taints. But if one does not attain the destruction of the taints because of that desire for the dharma, for that delight in the dharma, then with the destruction of the five lower fetters, they become one due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes and there attain final nirvana without ever returning from that world. This is the path, 
the way to the abandoning of the five lower fetters. All right. So there's a very important moment in that section there. So when the Buddha says, and what is the path, Ananda? <laughs> the jhana meditations. This is you know, not a big surprise, right? So we've heard it many, many times, right? The, this quite secluded from unwholesome states, quite secluded from sensual pleasures. We've heard it. And so if you were expecting a different path, <laughs> if you were expecting some other method, sorry, it is the classic method that it's always been, All right? So there's that. But there is a new, like, there is a little element to this presentation of the jhanas that I want to pay particular attention to. So the Buddha walks Ananda through the process, like, quickly, but he walks Ananda through the process of entering the first jhana, right? But then within that first jhana and by the way um what we're about to walk through is the process of what is called shamatha and vipassana calming down and gaining insight i know that you know that these are like the two essential aspects of buddhist practice we spend part of our practice is about calming the mind down but another part is about gaining insight. Well, if you were to seclude yourself from acquisitions, so from all of your stuff, abandon unwholesome states, so that's about precepts, so you're not running around lying, stealing, and being violent, and all of that, so you've abandoned unwholesome states, and then with the complete kind of calming or tranquilizing of the body, very secluded from sensual pleasures, you enter into this jhana. This is shamatha. You're removing yourself from sensual desires, removing yourself from the world, removing yourself, removing yourself, calming down and calming down. That's paragraph or section nine. Then the idea is, is now that you are in a calm jhanic state, Think about it this way. Whatever exists here, meaning of this body of mine, whatever exists herein, whether it is the material form aspect of the body, whether it are the sensations, what is being perceived, the habitual conditioning of all of this, and the very consciousness happening now in your geonic meditative calm state, you are understanding that those five aggregates are all impermanent. You are understanding that those five aggregates are suffering. That's all they are. They are to be looked at as like a disease, right? As as alien, it says, as not self. So this is the vipassana. Oh, this is this is impermanent. This is this is causing me anxiety. This is all of all of that. So then, with that attitude towards the aggregates, to the skandhas, right? Then there's this feeling of again of being alien. That the this fingernail is not me. The beard's not me. It is all impermanent. So then with that attitude, it says the practitioner turns the mind away from those states and directs it towards the amrita datu, the, the deathless realm or the deathless. So... I, I want to, this is going to be a little tricky. <laughs> so I, I recently taught a uh, long meditation retreat a few months ago, or I don't know how long ago it was now. A few of you were there. 
And it was a retreat using a, a very advanced Mahayana Buddhist meditation manual called the Six Gates to the Sublime. It's a beautiful meditation technique or a kind of a meditation process. It's pretty much just a very um, regimented presentation of classic Buddhist meditation. But I'm telling you this because A, I know some of you were there. Some of you probably know the, uh, the six gates to the sublime. But the process of that is about following the breath and counting the breath in order to kind of calm or stabilize the mind, like the sutra just talked about in terms of doing jhana practice to calm down. But then the key gate, the key gateway, the key practice to the six gates is what is called the gateway of turning. And what it is, it is exactly as is described in this sutta here, the turning the mind away from the aggregates and directing it towards the deathless, which is also nirvana, by the way, which is also liberation, you, you know, you name it. So this process of turning the mind, there's a lot of different ways to, to talk about this. And I do want to kind of, you know, finish this sutta tonight. So the basic idea though is, is that we, if I could try to put this super simply, so the mind can, as we've been talking about tonight, the mind can identify as the body. That like, that I am the aggregates. I am this. That is sort of the default mode in that way is identity with this body. When the mind is functioning in that way, in sort of in tandem with the body, what that means is, is that when something then happens to the body, like a pain, the mind becomes disturbed and affected by that. A good example that I've used in the past, it's a very very simple, benign example, but I think it gets the point across. And it's the phenomena of stubbing your toe and it being so painful, but noticing the mental reaction of anguish that comes from the pain of the toe. But if you're a skilled meditator, you've probably been able to divorce or separate your mind from that pain and observe the pain, but not with the mind that is affected by the pain. So what I'm getting at is, is that when mind is identified with body, it gets all turned around when things happen to the body. When, oh, and by the way, let's not limit it to the body, because that's only the first aggregate. This is about identifying with the physical body. And then if something happens to the physical body, the mind can be all, ah! Or there's the sensory body, the Vedana, and identifying with it, that's actually closer to my st toe stubbing example, is the Vedana, the pain, the negative reaction in that way. But then the same way with perception and the mind identifying with what is not with what is being perceived, but identifying as the perceiver. And then the mind being sort of disturbed by what is perceived. Another great example or another great tool is being able to separate the mind from habitual conditioning and to actually be able to see your own conditioning. 
rather than knee-jerk reaction to anger. <laughs> that would not be viewing the anger, that would be being identifying with it and, and habitually going along with your samskara. And so Buddhism is, a, is the process of not being the mind that is just going along with the aggregates, but being independent, sovereign mind that observes the aggregates. And then there's the fifth aggregate of consciousness, the one that we really identify with in that way, as self, very intimately. But in the same way that you can get a kind of ob an observing of your conditioning, you can observe the very thinking happening itself. Normally, we're too wrapped up in the thinking to have such perspective. But that is what's being spoken about in terms of turning the mind away from the aggregates and directing it towards the deathless element, directing it towards nirvana. And the mind regarding nirvana or the deathless, the mind understands that's peace. That's dispassion. That's cessation. That's nirvana. And if they are steady in that turning of the mind away from the aggregates, if they are steady in that, they attain the destruction of the taints. And then we have the part which it says, but if they don't fully attain the destruction of the taints, well, then they're going to be reborn spontaneously in a pure abode and there attain final nirvana without ever returning to the world. That's the language of non-returner. This is where they get the language of non-returner, actually. That idea. Any questions about any of that turning of the mind that we talked about? A lot of ideas happening here tonight. All right. Well, let's finish up the sutta. So that way we can make sure to do that. So that was shamatha vipassana. Finding a secluded place, removing yourself from sensual desires, entering the jhana, the first jhana, and then shifting to an insightful vipassana contemplation regarding the empty, or sorry, impermanent suffering nature of the aggregates, turning the mind away from them, directing it towards the deathless. And now the Buddha continues again with the stilling of applied and sustained thought. A bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the second jhana. And then again with the fading away of rapture, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the third jhana. And then again with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. Once again, in those jhanic states, in each of them, you would think whatever exists herein <laughs> form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness, one sees those states as impermanent, suffering, so on and so forth, as not self, turns the mind away from those states and directs it towards the deathless element to nirvana. And this is the path, the way to the abandoning of the five lower fetters. And then again, Ananda, with the complete surmounting of all perceptions of form, with the disappearance of perceptions of sensory impact, with non-attention to perceptions of diversity. Aware that space is infinite, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the base of infinite space. And then in that meditation of infinite space, once again, there is a movement to Vipassana thinking whatever exists here whether it's sensation, you'll notice that there's no form anymore because we are no longer in the form realm. 
So there's no longer five skandhas, just four up there or over there or wherever that is. But in that state of infinite space, whatever sensations or perception or conditioning or consciousness, they see that as all being impermanent as not self. Again, turning the mind away from those states and directing it towards the deathless. That's the path, the way to the abandoning of the five lower fetters. You guessed it. With the complete surmounting of the base of infinite space, aware that consciousness is infinite. A bhikkhu enters and abides in the base of infinite consciousness and then shifts to vipassana mode, thinking that whatever exists therein, whether it's sensation, perception, conditioning, or consciousness, those states are understood to be impermanent, suffering, ultimately not self. They turn the mind away from those states and direct it towards the deathless. This is the path, the way to the abandoning of the five lower fetters. And then again, with the complete surmounting of the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there's nothing, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the base of infinite nothingness. And then there, they shift to vibhashana mode and think whatever exists herein, sensations, perception, conditioning, consciousness, those states are impermanent, suffering, a disease, all the way up to no self. They turn the mind away from those states and direct it towards the deathless, thinking that the deathless, that's peaceful, that's sublime, that's stillness of all formations or all conditioning. That's the relinquishing of attachments. That's the destruction of craving, dispassion, cessation, nirvana. And if one is steady in that, one attains the destruction of the taints. But if they don't attain the destruction of the taints because of maybe a little desire for the Dharma or a little delighting in the Dharma, then with the destruction of the five lower fetters, they become one due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes and there attain final nirvana without ever returning from that world. This is the path, the way to the abandoning of the five lower fetters. Venerable Sir, this is the path, the way to the abandoning of the five lower fetters. Then how is it that, so oh, this is Ananda, I'm sorry, this is Ananda asking the Buddha, Venerable, this is If this is the path, the way to the abandoning of the five lower fetters, then how is it that some bhikkhus here are said to gain deliverance of mind and some are said to gain deliverance by wisdom? And the Buddha replied, the difference here, Ananda, is in their sense faculties. That's what I say. That's what the Blessed One said, and the Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Bing. All right, so I have some more to say about the ending there, but anything come up for anybody? Anything anybody would like to hear about or go deeper into? Then let me make one uh, interesting little uh, comment there. So the, that very end part there, where Ananda asks, if this is the path, then what's up with some people being uh, gaining deliverance of mind? Or, yeah, gaining deliverance of mind, but some others are said to gain deliverance by wisdom. Well, what's really interesting about that, and it's funny because I, I, this is an idea that I've, I've been teaching forever and I don't really know where I got it. Like it was just one of those things that just, I just knew, I don't know. I was just, it was just sort of there from the beginning, but this sutta is great because it kind of clarifies. And what it is, is that basically within the world of Buddhism, there's two tracks. I already mentioned it. There's the track of calming and there's the track of insight. And the idea here is that the idea of Buddhism is that those two tracks, 
doing just a bunch of bunch of meditation and calming down, calming down, bunch of shamatha, bunch of jhana, bunch of samadhi stuff. The idea is, is that if you do that, it will, well, it'll lead to liberation. It'll lead to the cessation of suffering. It'll lead to nirvana. Just doing the calming. Or you could just do the insight. You really just think, you can think your way to liberation. And traditionally, if you know your sort of your, um, your all your buddhist characters all the all the the people in buddhism you know the buddha always has a, a right hand attendant and a left hand attendant and our buddha had shariputra and madgulyayana and shariputra is shariputra the wise enlightened by wisdom whereas madgulyayana was enlightened through the mind but Mind means meditation here. Specifically, it's about like cultivating a meditative mind state. And Madhulyayana was the best at that. And so those two uh, like head monks, Madhulyayana and Shariputra, they, they always sort of represent those two tracks. And I think that this is important because there are, well, different types of people in the world with different underlying tendencies, right? Different kind of habits in that way. And so let me just finish the thought I started earlier, which was if you do the, the shamatha, the idea is, is that it sort of just leads to the insights. Like you, you will sort of have these insights. But the other way is, is that if you study these insights, you will naturally stop doing all the things that make you not calm. <laughs> In other words, the, the wisdom brings about natural states of calm, where all of a sudden it, it's much more preferable to just kind of sit quietly and not need stuff. That, that actually makes more sense through when you've studied the wisdom in that way. So, or it's a back and forth, back and forth kind of a thing in that way. So, right. but that's sort of like, um, it's an interesting, that little ending there about some are, are liberated by mind, some are liberated by wisdom. I think that that's a really interesting conclusion to this sutta that presented such an interesting shamatha vipassana approach to the path where it was equally uh, emphasizing the shamatha or you know the jhana practice, but it was equally emphasizing the insight practice around uh, primarily, of course, impermanence, suffering, no self. So, all right, that's all I had to say. <laughs> Any, I, I will. I actually do want to say one more thing about the death list, real quick. But unless there's Maria, please. Yeah, I think um, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but some Zen snuck, snuck in there too. Um, so the line that snuck stuck that snuck out that mm -hmm. stuck out for me was um, aware that there is nothing, and. I immediately, like, what sprang to mind was a memory of some uh, Zen master's account of their enlightenment moment, and they exclaim, and they start laughing really hard, and they just keep saying, there's nothing, there really is nothing. Um, so is this, is this about emptiness? No? No. Okay. Sorry. All right. <laughs> Talk to me. Um, yeah, so those are, you know, we went through... Uh, three of the four formless samadhis. And, you know, it's space, consciousness, nothingness. And I know, I definitely feel you on why you would hear it that way, because we spend so much time studying Mahayana Dharma and all of that. But it's really sort of about, um, like, 
to put it super simply, if I if I close my eyes and my somehow my ears and I plug my nose and I close my mouth, I have shut off sensory stimuli through those, but I would still in a way be sensory, sensorially stimulated by my body, like the temperature in the room, things like that. And I would be sensory stimulated by the thinking. And so as you move through the jhanas, well, the first thing that happens, we heard about it, is the tranquilization of bodily samskara. So that's actually dealing with the corporal tactile body and bringing that to where you are basically at that point desensitized, meaning the body, you, you would be so deep in meditation, people could poke you and you wouldn't feel it with the body. But even if you were in such a deep meditative state, the mind would still be going. That's what they're talking about in the jhanas regarding, but with sustained and applied thought. But then as you move through the jhanas, notice that there's no longer applied and sustained thought. In other words, when you're not being stimulated, stimulated by sensory input, the mind is still going to chatter for a while. But if you deprive it of sensory stimuli long enough, the mind will stop chattering. And pretty soon you could then move into a state where there is nothing being experienced. That's the nothingness they're talking about. Prior to that, you would kind of have an experience of consciousness only or of infinite consciousness. And before that, you would have had an experience of infinite space. And so you can see how you're like moving further and further away from sensory stimuli. Space is still kind of stimulating, even though it's like vacuous space. And that's why you got to get to that third one of there's nothing going on. But not because there's nothing going on like in the Zen tradition in that way, but cool. Oh, um, I wanted to clarify the deathless nirvana thing really quickly. So I'm going to actually do it though in a Hinayana way. I want to emphasize the more early Buddhist way of thinking about nirvana. So what I want you to think about is, and I've used this example before, but it's about my cousin, my cousin doesn't exist actually. I don't, I don't have a cousin. All right, so now let's direct our minds to my cousin. And what I want you to first think about is when was my cousin born? Oh, that, that doesn't compute, right? That, that Because if my cousin doesn't exist, there's no... <laughs> the birth of what, right? Ah, so my cousin that doesn't exist doesn't have a birthday. You know what else that means? My cousin doesn't die. That is the death, the deathless. Okay. So everybody got that about how my cousin wasn't born, doesn't die because my cousin doesn't actually exist? Well, the Buddha has said there's no self. That it actually, the 50-year-old doesn't actually exist. That's an idea, but you will never actually find that 50-year-old self. It's just like my cousin, actually has never come into existence and luckily will never go out of existence. So what I'm getting at is, is that think about my cousin that doesn't exist. And what I want you to think about in terms of the non-existent that doesn't, isn't born and doesn't die. I want you to think about how it is very peaceful that which has never come into existence. It's very sublime. 
it's very still, there's nothing to be attached to, right? Craving for what? Passion for what? What I'm getting at is that all the language that the Buddha talks about in terms of the deathless, that it is still, peaceful, sublime, nothing to be attached to. What I want you to notice is, is like really put di direct your mind towards the non-existent and just feel how still and peaceful and quiet it is. Well, the sutra was telling us to turn the mind away from obsession with the skandhas and direct it towards that deathless. But you're doing this because it's going to calm your mind down. Meaning thinking about my cousin that doesn't exist doesn't get you all worked up. <laughs> now, if my cousin did exist and looked a certain way, it might get you all worked up. But my cousin that doesn't exist, it is very hard for them to get you all worked up in that way. So again, it's not about like, I don't know. It's about directing the mind towards that very idea of nirvana, the deathless. And rather than the mind resting on a bunch of stimuli, it's resting on this utter peacefulness. It's a technique is my point, but it's a method. So, Noe? Wow. Great stuff. I, I, what, what, uh, and it's constant. It's constant. It's always happening if I pay attention to it because, you know, so there's no separation. And now, oh, and now, and so it is the effort, but then it's like, I, we, we talked about this years ago where it's the, the levels of the, the, the Giannis. And then what happens when you get to the end? You start back at the beginning <laughs> and we mm -hmm. start back at the beginning. So I mm -hmm. really appreciate that so much. Uh, and then the thing too about the addiction thing, something that has happened to me is the qualifications that I always use in a program that I, I'm a member of. Uh, I've learned to say, I'm an alcoholic. My name is Noe. So I, <laughs> I've learned to separate the I am. And that's been a real mind blower to me. So thank you for your teachings and thank you uh, all for listening. Thanks, Dewey. Thanks for that comment. Excellent. Anything else? All right, then we did another one. Excellent. Lot of good ideas in that one. Lot of deep ideas. All right. Well, then that's going to conclude this uh, session of Dharma Doors. Stay tuned till next week. <laughs>